the world to come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack. Part 1 brought crucial setup to the subject of the Trinity. The world has been deceived about the true God, believing in a triune deity. Part 2 presents an extensive look at the history of the Trinitarian God, including who propelled it. How did the Trinity come to be accepted by Christianity? How was knowledge of the true God lost? Here are the facts from history. You will be shocked. Part 2 begins with a fascinating longer account illustrating why superstitious man will even worship all gods at the same time to be sure to include the true one. The Apostle Paul is speaking to Greek polytheists. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, your gods, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things, and is made of one blood all nations of men, that's all races, for to dwell on all the face of the earth." that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, Paul continues, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Paul noted the unknown God. The Greeks had devised a catch-all inscription to include any God missed in their devotions. They had left no stone unturned, worshiping every deity. Truly, the God of the Bible has been unknown to countless millions content to worship a God selected for them by men. Theologians and religionists have sought the opinions of philosophers, scholars, and supposed experts instead of the only important opinion, that of God found in His Word. You are about to see that, centuries ago, these religious leaders brought a god to the masses who were willing to swallow it without proof. Let's ask, what is the ultimate difference between the god of the Bible and all other gods? How does God differentiate himself? All through Scripture, God describes himself as the living God, the eternal I am that I am, the name he told Moses to use before Pharaoh. The God of the Bible separates himself from all other gods by declaring himself to be alive, living, meaning all other gods are non-existent or, in a sense, dead. Put another way, the true God states, I am, meaning other gods are not, period. Continually ask, throughout the series whether you are worshiping the true God, the God who is alive, or something non-existent and dead, a God who is not. This question towers over all others before you. Having wanted to appear to follow the God of creation, modern theologians have not honestly explored the Trinity God in light of plain facts from history and scripture. Millions of professing Christians, also unwilling to explore the facts for themselves, follow these deceived men. They remain duped by dishonest, seductive arguments designed by the God of this world to lead them to worship of Himself. In their vanity, they have foolishly rejected vital knowledge. The result has been so many have unnecessarily become darkened, blinded to plain understanding of God. For God to require obedience to His first four commandments without explaining who and what He is would be cruel. Not equipping His worshipers to be able to distinguish Him from other gods would have been grossly unfair. 
This series equips you as God intended. When confronting 450 prophets of Baal trying to lead Israel away from the true God, the prophet Elijah presented ancient Israel with the ultimate question and the choice facing you. Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. All that follows will prepare and arm you to answer what Israel would not. It has been said that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. To truly unlearn all that the Trinity entails, one must examine how it developed, its history. We now cover the origin of the teaching spanning thousands of years, even before the time of Christ. You will see that theologians rely on human reasoning because they completely dismiss crucial facts of history. This series is loaded with these facts, bringing quote after quote from respected, reliable historians. Detail is presented so the viewer cannot miss the big picture. The detail is necessary. These quotes bring important background about what was happening in the New Testament church. They are essential to understand first, before examining the period when the Trinity gained acceptance. These facts are compelling. It is vital you carefully examine these many sources for their message. The Trinity will be seen to have roots almost entirely in philosophy and abstract metaphysics and human reasoning. Remember from part one that elements of this series will be difficult or impossible to understand and why this is good. You will find yourself wondering how anyone could possibly believe the Trinity is scriptural. Long before the Christian era, a great many variations of a threefold God existed. Pagan religions and mythologies were shot through with them. As with so many other pagan customs and practices that found their way into Christianity, the revival of this doctrine after Christ ascended to heaven was predictable. It was essential that followers be able to see Christianity in familiar terms. Offering pagans a three-in-one God became all-important to add believers and gain power by authorities. Triad, or three-in-one deities, first appeared in ancient Egypt soon after the great flood of Noah's time, around 2300 BC. These came to be worshipped as Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Some facts of early history. After the destruction of the Tower of Babel, Nimrod and his wife mother Semiramis, the first rulers of Babylon, fled to Egypt. Nimrod, known as Ninus or Athothis, among many other names, shared rulership with his father Cush, or Menes, in Egypt's first dynasty. After Nimrod's death, Semiramis claimed their son Horus was Nimrod reincarnated. These three, Osiris, Nimrod, Isis, Semiramis, and Horus, their son, came to be exalted. In Babylon, these same three were known as Ninus, Ishtar, and Tammuz. Over time, this triad became well known in many nations. In ancient Rome, a triad of deities was worshipped, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, and they bore similarities to earlier trinities. Virtually all ancient religions possessed triad deities. Notice this astonishing acknowledgement. Though it is usual to speak of the Semitic tribes as monotheistic, yet it is an undoubted fact that more or less all over the world the deities are in triads. This rule applies to eastern and western hemispheres, to north and south. Further, it is observed that in some mystical way the triad of three persons is one applied to the trinities of all heathen religions. An example is found in the ancient roots of Hinduism. After the 6th century BC, Hinduism featured the three-in-one god that became known as the Trimurti. The god Brahman consisted of Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. It's now time to ask, 
How did the Trinity get into mainstream Christianity? Why were so many followers receptive to the very same schools of philosophy that had been rejected by first century Christians? After the original apostles died, contradictions in teachings, meaning false doctrine, began to appear in mass, and church history became lost. Famous historian Edward Gibbon acknowledged, the scanty and suspicious materials of ecclesiastical history seldom enable us to dispel the dark cloud that hangs over the first age of the church. For nearly a century after events in the book of Acts, about A.D. 70 to 170, we find church history is virtually blank. Jesse Lyman Hurlbut calls this time the Age of Shadows. Of all the periods in the church's history, it is the one about which we know the least. For 50 years after St. Paul's life, a curtain hangs over the church, through which we strive vainly to look, and when at last it rises, about 120 A.D., with the writings of the earliest church fathers, we find a church in many aspects very different from that in the days of Peter and Paul. The New Testament offers many verses proving apostasy was occurring, pulling believers from the truth. Paul warned that the mystery of iniquity does already work, as he wrote, and of false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now another scripture, contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, among other verses. Returning from exile, an old apostle John confronted the growing apostasy in the A.D. 90s. False leaders had gained control over congregations of the true church in Asia Minor. Here is one account of the controversy. I, John, wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he did, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbids them that would, and casts them out of the church. Such occurrences were repeated in many congregations and continued under Polycarp, John's successor. No wonder John also wrote, Try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Secular history also shows how false leaders changed the direction of the church and cast out the few brethren who remained loyal to the apostles' teachings. About A.D. 135, the Jerusalem Pella congregation came under control of an Italian named Marcus. He persuaded the majority to renounce the Ten Commandments, and only those brethren who did this were permitted admittance into Jerusalem by the Roman authorities. A faithful few refused to follow Marcus. Notice, the crimes of heresy and schism were imputed to the obscure remnant of the Nazarenes, that's an early name for the true church, which refused to accompany their Latin bishop. In a few years after the return of the Church of Jerusalem, it became a matter of doubt and controversy whether a man who sincerely acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah, but who still continued to observe the law of Moses, that's the Ten Commandments, could possibly hope for salvation. Marcus' followers excluded their Judaizing brethren, as God's people were also labeled, from the hope of salvation and from the common offices of friendship, hospitality, and social life. The remnant of the apostolic church, those determined to adhere to the teachings of Jesus Christ and the apostles, were accused of Judaizing. This derogatory term implied that such a person sought to earn salvation by obeying God's commandments, including the Sabbath and annual holy days. The church that emerged in the early 2nd century was dramatically different from the 1st century church. Let's see. Christian churches had scarcely been gathered and organized when here and there men rose up who, not being contented with the simplicity and purity of that religion which the apostles taught, attempted innovations and fashioned religion according to their own liking. 
But the apostasy, part of an orchestrated movement away from the truth, was called orthodox, while the small remnant apostolic true church was suppressed, persecuted, and forced into hiding. Now another historian. Toward the latter end of the second century, most of the churches assumed a new form. The first simplicity disappeared, and insensibly, as the old disciples retired to their graves, their children, along with new converts, both Jews and Gentiles, came forward and new-modeled the cause. During the second century, Polycarp had to confront this. The steady progress of the heretical movement, in spite of all opposition, was a cause of deep sorrow to Polycarp, so that in the last years of his life, the words were constantly on his lips, O good God, to what times have you spared me that I must suffer such things? For instance, Polycarp and his successor Polycrates witnessed the wholesale departure of organized Christianity from observing Passover on the 14th day of the first month of God's calendar to the observance of Easter, an utterly pagan holiday. The faithful minority in Asia Minor, along with the Nazarenes of Syria, were the last holdouts of true Christianity in the eastern Mediterranean area of the Roman Empire. All the apostates were steeped in the accepted philosophies of that time, Gnosticism in particular. Let's read. The Mosaic account of the creation and fall of man was treated with profane derision by the Gnostics. The God of Israel was impiously represented by the Gnostics as being liable to passion and to error. Gibbon explains the Gnostics' techniques. The Gnostics were distinguished as the most polite, the most learned, and the most wealthy of the Christian name. And that general appellation, which expressed a superiority of knowledge assumed by their own pride, the Gnostics blended with the faith of Christ many sublime but obscure tenets which they derived from Oriental philosophy. But Christ had built His church and promised it could not be destroyed. While the visible church steadily gained preeminence, and as persecution increased on the true church, its remnants went underground to survive. As a result, the new Christianity of the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries had almost nothing in common with the practices and beliefs of 1st century Christians. My book, Where is the True Church and Its Incredible History, tells this amazing story. Converts of this religion in transition dismissed biblical authority, replacing it with what came to be viewed as orthodox teachings. They considered Greek philosophy and Gnosticism more attractive and familiar. Here is a short overview of how philosophers and theologians disregarded biblical teaching and authority. Number one. Orthodox Christianity came to accept that the Father was the Creator rather than having created through Jesus Christ. John's Gospel plainly states that Christ, whom he calls the Word, created all things. Also read Colossians 1, 13-17. 2. It came to accept that the Father was the God of the Old Testament, but the Bible shows this person was in fact Jesus Christ. 3. Orthodox Christianity believed that many people had spoken with the Father in the Old Testament, yet Jesus declared that no man had seen or heard the Father. And, because the Father was unknown to the world, one purpose of Christ's coming was to reveal Him. Read John 1.18 and Luke 10.22. 4. It came to believe that the Father and Son are one in some mystical way. But the Bible says the Father and Son are one in the same sense that all members of the church are one, in unity and purpose. 5. Orthodox Christianity accepted the premise of Judaism concerning monotheism, that God was one being. Yet, two distinct beings are identified in the beginning of John's Gospel. Similarly, Genesis 1.26 records a conversation between these two two God beings. It says, let us make man in our image. The word God in Genesis 1 derives from the Hebrew Elohim, which is uniplural, or a collective noun, like kingdom, family, church, or group. 
rather than the God family being a closed trinity, this family will expand through the many begotten sons of God yet to be born into it. Read these verses. Although Orthodox Christianity contradicts the Bible, the Bible does not contradict itself. On a related point, one that confuses many, the Jewish doctrine of monotheism comes from a misunderstanding of Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This passage is correctly translated, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God alone or only. This verse is not talking about God as one being. It is not addressing the nature of God, but rather was instruction to Israel to not listen to other gods, but to listen to the true God alone, only. The context of Deuteronomy 6.4 is immediately after the Ten Commandments were listed by Moses to establish the requirements and authority of the true God. How the Trinity became accepted is revealing. The Nicene Council of A.D. 325 was the pivotal event that marked its acceptance. Two opposing theologies or factions took part in this historic controversy. Rather than treating the Bible as direct instruction from God, the Orthodox movement used God's Word to allegorically explain preconceived philosophies. Notice the first of several difficult-to-understand quotes, but ones that are so telling. The Old Testament, allegorically explained, became the substitute for the outgrown mythology. Intellectual activity revived. The new facts gained predominant influence in philosophy. Translated, this means the Bible's literal meaning was thrown out, reduced to a mere starting point for allegorical interpretation. Notice, as in philosophy, so now in theology, the easiest solution of the problem was the denial of one of its factors, and successively these efforts were made until a solution was found in the doctrine of the Trinity, which satisfied both terms of the equation. Philosophy veiled thinly in theology and became the fundamental creed of the Church. The new movement hailed the Trinity as a solution to various contradictions in their understanding. It seemed to satisfy the requirement of monotheism while acknowledging that Christ was God in the flesh. Notice, its molds of thought are those of Greek philosophy, and into these were run the Jewish teachings. We have thus a peculiar combination. The religious doctrines of the Bible, as culminating in the person of Jesus, run through the forms of an alien philosophy. Now more early insight into the origin of the Trinity. The doctrine is, quote, not primarily ethical, nor even religious, but it is metaphysical. What is the ontological relationship between these three factors, Father, Son, and Spirit? The answer is given in the Nicene formula, which is characteristically Greek, meaning Greek philosophy. This quote acknowledges that the Trinity was not primarily ethical nor even religious. At best, it categorizes the triune God as a metaphysical afterthought. Now consider an unusual admission by Catholic scholars. We must be willing to admit that, should the doctrine of the Trinity have to be dropped as false, the major part of religious literature could well remain virtually unchanged. The Christian's idea of the Incarnation would not have to change at all if there were no Trinity. Let's summarize. The Catholics could throw out their God and it would not affect their belief system. Stunning. One must question how the Trinity could ever grow to such a position of importance. The Greek philosopher Plato, 427 to 347 BC, tried to define God. Most Greek philosophy was based on his theories, later developing into Middle Platonism and eventually Neoplatonism. All other philosophical schools of Greek origin, such as the Pythagoreans, were greatly influenced by Platonism. Plato is considered the greatest of all philosophers. His central dogma asserted that the ideal forms an absolute and eternal reality, and that this physical world is but an imperfect and transitory reflection. 
If this is difficult to understand, remember the uneducated and unwashed are not supposed to understand the great thinkers. Since the concept of triad deities permeated all ancient religions, Plato was deeply ingrained in Trinitarian thought. He wanted to better define God above the many deities in Greek mythology. Recall what Paul found in Athens. Plato's definition consisted of, one, the first God who was the supreme being in the universe, two, the second God whom Plato described as the soul of the universe, and three, the third God defined as the spirit. Ignoring the Bible, men, and this is astonishing, came to regard Plato's view as mankind's best effort to define God. Another theologian, Philo of Alexandria, Egypt, brought great influence on developing Trinitarian thought. He lived about 15 BC to AD 50. From the second to fourth centuries, this Jewish philosopher's influence was profound. Himself greatly influenced by Plato, Philo's Trinity was unique. This lifelong follower of Greek philosophy saw God as one Father who created all things. Philo called him the Demiurge, two, mother, who was knowledge the maker possessed, and three, beloved son, was the world. Demiurge in knowledge, father and mother, supposedly produced man's world. Such is philosophy. Get this. It was this kind of esoteric junk that drove the birth and development of the Trinity. Different from Plato's version, Philo's trinity blended Platonism and Stoicism and set the course of Christian philosophy. In Greek philosophy, Philo chiefly follows the Platonic doctrines of ideas and the soul of the world and the Stoic doctrine of God as the reason operative in the world. In its Stoic form, the latter doctrine was pantheistic, meaning many gods, but Philo could adapt it to his purpose simply by drawing a sharper distinction between the Logos and the world. Hopefully you're confused. Finally, here is how Greek philosophy influenced Philo. Philo certainly, to judge by his historical influence, was the greatest of all these Jewish philosophers, and in whole the substance of his philosophy, the Jewish point of view is more or less completely modified, sometimes almost extinguished, by what he has learned from the Greeks. Their influence on Philo is nowhere more strongly seen than in the detailed development of his doctrine of God. Philo's common bond to Greek philosophy made him a significant influence in Christian thought, and thus in the development of the Trinity. There is much more to learn, but we are out of time. Do not miss part three. We are just warming up. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To learn more or to find a local congregation, contact us to receive a personal response from a minister.